Uh, thank you, JD. Uh, so uh, we'll give you a five-minute break, and we start again with the session. Uh, we found two cell phones, so check if you have yours. And if you want them, it's over there uh, at the back. Donc, cinq minutes de pause, et après, on, on reprend très rapidement sur les sessions. Et je vous remercie. Thank you very much. Indeed, we are going to start with the first session after the brilliant uh, presentation we already had before this. So if everyone can come back into the room, then we can uh, really start. So this first uh, session, this first session uh, of the conference is about the capital, uh, looking for opportunities in affordable housing. My name is Sebastian Garnier. I work as, an, uh, uh, as a consultant based in, in Brussels, working mainly on uh, giving advice in affordable and social housing uh, projects, trying to, to bring, indeed, financiers and capital together with, uh, with projects. Um, in this session, we are going to explore the landscape of housing investments in, in Africa. Um, I think it was already mentioned, you all have uh, received a leaflet as well, uh, of this amazing CAF's yearbook 2018, which has a lot of fact sheets and a lot of data on the, on the, on the trends. It's a very dynamic uh, sector. And um, so and it's, it's been growing a lot. And uh, to give you more details about this, uh, we will first have a presentation by uh, Davina uh, Woods, and then we will continue this conversation with our uh, panel. So maybe I can already ask you to come on stage, uh, Davina, and we'll also ask the rest of the panel to join us here. Um, and then I will, I will uh, present each one uh, of you. So, Ahmed, I think Soli is over there. And then we... I will ask also Yasmina Mikwar from Apis to join us. Is she in the room? Maybe not. <laughs> Okay, sorry, great. So our first speaker, uh, Davida Woods, uh, uh, is a consultant for uh, uh, CAFS, uh, uh, the Center for Affordable Housing Finance in Africa. She has previously worked in the uh, banking sector and uh, will give you us an overview uh, in the next uh, 30 minutes about these different uh, developments we have uh, been witnessing. So the floor is you, Davina. Can we give her a hand, please? Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, hi, everyone. Absolutely delighted to be here to talk about CAF's recent study on the investment housing landscape in Africa. Um, before we get going, I just thought we'd have a quick moment to remind ourselves, which we have discussed already a little bit earlier today, as to why we care so much about investment in housing. Um, what this slide is, is discussing, and there are many different studies that have yielded different results, are the social and economic benefits of investing in housing. We know that there are strong links between improvements in housing and increased um, productivity, health, and other measures of well-being, but there are also really powerful economic effects in terms of income multipliers and job creation. Um, one study in particular showed that for every unit of currency spent directly on house construction, an additional unit of currency is added to demand in the economy. Um, again, it depends on which economy you're talking about, where it is in its investment cycle, but this is pretty compelling information. Um, in terms of job creation, I've seen estimates that range from 5 to 15 jobs created um, for every $10,000 of investment. Um, CAF recently completed a study, it's on their website as well, about housing's contribution to GDP in South Africa, which found that um, it contributed about 2.4% in 2014. So back to the study. Um, this is obviously a huge task. <laughs> it could go on forever. Um, so we needed to set some parameters. 
And for that, we used CAF's housing value chain um, as an initial framework. The first question is, how do we define an investor? Um, investors, for us, facilitate finance moments as you move along the housing value chain. Um, so they're providing the funding necessary to move forward along the chain. They're not the builders and they're not the contractors, but they're, they're providing the finance that these actors need to, need to deliver. In terms of geographical areas covered, it's covered the East African community, um, the Southern African development community, and also a handful of countries in Central, North, and West Africa. Uh, the study had two components to it. The first um, includes all of the individual investments tracked in a database, and the second portion are, um, consists of individual country reports and regional reports. Before we move on, there's one thing I want to make very clear, and that is, while we attempted to be as exhaustive as possible, it would be absolutely impossible to capture every single investment in this space in a desktop study. Um, not only is some of this information only available on the ground, but some of it is also not publicly disclosed. For example, private equity deals, um, where those terms are, are just not published. But the point is that this information should be seen as representative of broader trends. So what this slide shows is total investment in SADC. And what we're seeing here is a very positive upward trend. Um, it seems to be occurring across the continent. Another thing um, that the data provided support to is that governments in particular are paying greater attention to housing. Um, as a, by way of example, seven of the eight WAMU countries Governments initiated large-scale housing programs in the early 2010s. Other leading investors, which are um, measured by capital deployed over the period, um, include DFIs, pension funds, Chinese entities, and banks, and we'll highlight some of these shortly. Uh, one finding from the study, which verified a common and, and, and certainly proven hypothesis, is that the deeper the local capital markets, the higher the level of housing investment. Similarly, um, larger, more stable economies tend to attract more investment. South Africa is a prime example of this. And countries that have deep pockets thanks to oil resources or that emerging from a post-conflict state um, are frequent investment targets. Angola ticks both those boxes, for example. So now we're going to dig a little deeper into several trends that we saw in the data. DFIs, pension funds, the Chinese, and then we'll look a bit at the portfolio, um, including strategies and the different investment vehicles used. Um, in many countries, the largest invent investors were DFIs. Um, AFDB really takes the lead in this. Our estimates are that in the areas that we covered, over $5 billion were, um, was invested by AFDB in housing-related activities, which is huge. Um, this table shows the largest DFI investors in SADC, but these, these are very frequent players throughout the market. What it also shows is a fairly even split between um, Africa-based EU and US-based institutions. Typical DFI product is debt, which we probably all know either in the form of market rate loans or lines of credit. Um, this makes a lot of sense given the back-ended funding structure of DFIs and, and their risk appetite. Pension funds. Um, so research has also shown that there's a positive correlation between pension funds and developed housing markets. Our study showed this as well, which is great. Um, and we were also excited to find that in many economies, pension funds are ramping up their investment. Uh, one constraint that's worth noting is that pension funds often don't distinguish between different real estate investment classes. Um, so residential and commercial are just grouped into one. It's therefore, it's likely that a lot of the capital they're investing is actually in commercial, but um, because there's greater li liquidity in those areas and more investment opportunities. But nevertheless, it's a positive sign that more money is going towards property in general. This slide has a couple of examples. Um, 
The Government Employee Pension Fund in South Africa is the largest single institutional investor in affordable housing that we found. Um, closer to home here, Senegal, one of its two pension funds owns, I think it's around, I can't read that very well from here, but 8% of um, the largest mortgage or one of the largest mortgage banks in Senegal. We're also seeing more and more activity in this area in East Africa. Uh, Kenyan law now allows for pension funds um, beneficiaries rather to use up to 60% of their savings as collateral towards loans. Um, in Uganda, it's now 50%. So that's really promising. They're, pay they're paving the way forward for more pension-backed loans. So Chinese loans to Africa. Again, we've all heard that the Chinese are heavily invested. Um, but it was interesting to put some numbers behind this statement. Um, this map is driven, the, the little map there that you see is driven by size data, but it, it largely supports our findings. Um, what it shows is that the total amount of loans um, from China to, to African countries, so government or state-owned enterprises, uh, between 2000 and 2015 was about 94 billion, um, uh, 4.3 billion of which went to the category that includes housing. Angola is the largest recipient, followed by Ethiopia and then Kenya. Um, China was also the largest institutional investor in East Africa. Um, its exposure actually surpassed the combined investment of US-based DFIs. Features very strongly in the top list of 20 investors in SADC as well. Um, one interesting development, that an example that I thought would be interesting um, to note is the IFC's recent collaboration with Sitec. Sitec is a wholly state-owned enterprise contractor from China, one of the largest in the world, certainly one of the largest that's operating here in Africa. So together, Sitec and the IFC created a $300 million platform specifically for the development of affordable housing. Um, the IFC made an equity contribution, I think it's a 20% shareholder, and their, their talks, I'm not sure how far along they are with this, with mobilizing some matching debt. Um, the idea is to partner with local housing developers and with the goal of developing around 30,000 units. Um, as far as I know, or, or what Habib told me just now, <laughs> they're still in the process of going through creating a pipeline, but it's, it's interesting to see this direct collaboration between the Chinese and uh, DFIs operating in this space. Um, now we're looking a little bit at the portfolio of investments, um, or th the intent, what the, the goal was from the investor. Um, we grouped strategies into six different areas. Financing SMEs, supporting the financial sector, building housing, housing finance, infrastructure, and slum upgrading. Um, we included supporting the financial sector and SMEs uh, as, as they're related to housing delivery and finance. Um, on the debt side, the left side, we see that about 35% of debt instruments um, went, or investments went towards financing SMEs. And on the equity side, um, we, you know, mo most large-scale equity investments include funding large construction projects, which we see 36% of equity went to, or um, investing in local banks. So a good example of that would be Westbridge's recent purchase of B BHCI. Um, the housing funding mix. So here we're examining the different investment prod products used and to sort of pull out the data a little bit on grant financing um, or grants rather and technical assistance versus debt and equity. Those two are their own separate categories. Um, we're seeing, I mean, you can, you can kind of take a look at this and, and make what you, you want of it, but uh, by way of example, policy development projects, so housing policy projects are purely funded by technical assistance. That's at the top. They receive 19% of technical assistant funds, um, assistance funds in the projects that we tracked. Um, we also thought it would be interesting to highlight a few individual case studies. Um, 
that sort of discuss different themes that emerged from our study. I'm sure everyone has heard of IHS, <laughs> um, and saw these on our panel. Um, but if you haven't, it's a pretty well-known fund manager in South Africa. Um, it's, a, it's a nice example of high-impact private equity in the affordable housing space. Um, they have about $482 million under management, not including their listed REIT. Um, and they've leveraged loads of investment from DFIs, pension funds, government agencies. Um, and I believe that and I, this number might be outdated. Um, over the years, they've either developed or managed around 35,000 units. We've also <laughs> heard a lot about this mortgage liquidity facility, but um, we wanted to highlight it as an example of DFI investment. Um, here I'm referencing mainly the World Bank, the IFC, who helped to set it up, um, th that is deepening capital markets uh, with the goal of increasing housing finance. Um, I learned this morning that it's actually seven round of rounds of bonds, and they've recently received some new financing, some new funding, um, that is expected to result in around 50,000 new mortgages in the coming years. So definitely an interesting space to watch. Um, this is an example of Ethiopia's integrated housing development program of a purely state-led program. Um, it's been incredibly successful in terms of the number of units that they have built. It's around 350,000 at a total cost to government if you include the various subsidies such as the price of land. Ethiopia's government owns all land. Um, it's estimated at about 2.8 billion. That's a ballpark figure. Um, so again, lots of impact in terms of number of units delivered. They've really stimulated the construction industry, created loads of jobs. However, this really state-led, top-down approach has had some unintended um, impacts, namely the private sector has sort of been crowded out and a mortgage market hasn't developed locally outside of the IHDP. Um, some other things are that the intended beneficiary isn't always who winds up in the unit because there's such a strong demand for these units. Once they hit the secondary market, a big premium is added to them and frequently they move up the economic pyramid. Um, Senegal's approach is state-led, but involves the private sector a lot more. That's why I thought it would be interesting to dovetail off of Ethiopia's. Um, their, their large economic development plan includes the creation, the building of a master plan city just outside of Dakar in order to ease population pressures on Dakar. And um, it's expected to be home to around 300,000 people. Uh, they're using a PPP model along the way. Um, in fact, the, the road, the toll road that was constructed to this new city is an example of a PPP that went really well. Um, and th they're not only providing land at concessional pricing, but the BHS is also providing some mortgage financing for the offtake. Um, the Shego is an example of a large-scale microfinance institution that's been able to tap into the capital markets and also does have a line of business specifically for housing. They're now present in 11 countries. It's originally from Botswana. Um, and they've really grown their mortgage portfolio in East Africa, where they raised a, a fund specifically for that. More recently, when they IPO'd in Namibia, they announced that they would be following a similar strategy there. So it's quite exciting to see that happening um, on such a large scale, but at this lower level microfinance space. Finally, um, in Kenya, we have the example of savings and credit cooperatives. Um, it's been estimated, there's a range of estimates, that between 50 and 90% of housing finance in Kenya is actually supplied by um, SACOs and housing cooperatives. They're really popular um, because the loans are well-priced. It's probably thanks to their nonprofit status, and it's a relatively easy process. You become a member by buying shares, and then you can take out a loan at a multiple of your savings. 
Um, the fact that savings are their main source of funds, however, creates constraints. They can't extend loans for long periods of time because savings are short term. Um, so their ability to lend is limited in that regard. And, uh, they have to tap outside sources of funding. Some lending from Co-op Bank, for example, is a common source, but it, that can be that, that can put some pressure on the cost of funds. So this is being examined, this constraint, and I think um, there are several government initiatives to try to ease it that are happening now, um, and they're also expected to play a large part in the government's new. Um, goal, which came out last year, part of its four pillar strategy is to build one million new units of housing by 2023. So they're a key, key actor in that. Um, finally, some takeaways and ways forward. So we all know that housing is, compared to commercial, slightly riskier asset class and, in general, a lower level of market information makes it really difficult for investors to project returns, which in turn deters targeted investments. So the, the critical need for not only more, but more reliable data in this space is, is really important to highlight. Um, governments can help in that, regard, in that regard. They can insist on reporting from financial institutions, both banks and MFIs. They can insist that this reporting is broken down by use of loan. Often we find that, for example, in MFIs, loans that are actually being used for housing are just simply called personal loans or consumer loans, so you can't really get to their real exposure. Um, governments can also enforce reporting to credit bureaus when or if they exist. And they can continue to work in conjunction, as we've seen quite a bit, with DFIs to provide access to long-term capital to get that capital market support. Um, again, just in terms of getting the information out there, new deals should be highlighted. And in terms of what CAF's planning on doing with this data, um, the intention is to set up an online investment tracker platform where you can go in and access on a country basis or by investor the activity in this area and actually see what's going on with the hope to stimulate further investment. So that's it. Thanks for your time. Um, I don't know Thank if you. there's time for any questions or if we want to move on. So, uh, if you're open to questions, indeed, I, I uh, offer the opportunity to ask some questions to, to Davida on the presentation. We can chat after. <laughs> Anyone? And otherwise, we uh, just move on. No questions? Then we move on to uh, the panel. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Je voulais juste euh, demander à, à, à madame l'étude qui a été faite. Je ne sais pas si j'ai bien suivi, mais il n'y a pas eu d'étude sur la Côte d'Ivoire. Je veux qu'il y ait une étude sur le Sénégal. Donc je voulais juste savoir euh, s'il n'y avait pas eu d'étude sur la Côte d'Ivoire également, en ce qui concerne le logement social. Puisque euh, eux, c'est 16 000 logements. Nous, on en a déjà construit 12 000. Peut-être que ça vaut le coup d'une étude. quoi. Merci. Merci. Maybe we, we can just take this one, it's a very practical question. Did, did you go? Yeah. So I, I believe the question was whether we covered the Côte d'Ivoire in our study. Yeah. Um, we did. And <laughs> I, I should have drawn on some examples. The only one I have is the purchase of BHCI. Um, but if you'd want to read the full report, it is posted on the CAF website. Um, the individual country report, and we do have a regional report on WAMU that includes quite a bit of information on, on Côte d'Ivoire. Okay, thank you. There is another question, I believe. No? Pour les questions, vous avez des, des micros sur vos tables, et fondamentalement, on, on, on espère qu'il y ait beaucoup de questions parce que c'est les échanges qui, qui créent la valeur. Donc merci de poser des questions et il n'y a pas de mauvaises questions. Merci. So indeed, don't be shy. Uh, ask everything. This is your opportunity to get to know more about this. So we will move on to the to the panel. We have really uh, exceptional uh, speakers with us uh, uh, today. Uh, this panel is about the, uh, looking for project, uh, projects from the uh, investors' uh, perspective. 
So, um, uh, welcome, uh, Yasmina uh, Mikwa. You are from uh, APIS, Vice President at, uh, at APIS. Indeed, APIS is a private uh, uh, equity fund manager focusing on uh, innovative uh, financial services in growth markets such as uh, Africa. We also have with us uh, Ahmed Atouz, you are uh, Chief uh, Capital Markets uh, Officer at the African uh, Development Bank. Uh, that doesn't need any introduction, so welcome uh, as well. And uh, we also have uh, Soli um, Mobweni, I hope I pronounced it right, Head of Housing Operations at the International Housing uh, Solutions. You are based in, in South Africa, sorry. Warm welcome to you as well. I will start with you because I think you, you have uh, some slides to, to show us. We are a little bit restricted on time, but uh, please, uh, maybe you can uh, go to mic so you can uh, direct the presentation. Thank you. Uh, good morning, bonjour colleagues. Um, all protocol observed. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come and share um, IHS experiences uh, uh, with you uh, here. And, uh, you know, uh, thanks, uh, Sebastian, for putting me under pressure. You know, when before you speak, they tell you that we are under pressure of time. They're basically telling you that you must just hurry up and, uh, and get on with the job. I, um, uh, I prefer to, uh, to show some slides uh, because what I want to do today here is just to, to share our experience and also to uh, say to the affordable housing community out there that um, it is possible, it is doable. Um, we know that there are so many challenges, but um, the little bit of intervention from every part of the financing chain um, uh, does help, might be small, but in the end, it all adds up. Um, I hope I've got this right. Um, we, know, we all know about the, the challenge um, that we are facing in, in Africa, and I think it's a, it's a worldwide phenomenon, but uh, we're focusing on Africa uh, um, today. Um, my, my presentation is going to be slightly biased uh, towards rental housing, um, one of the speakers um, uh, earlier on mentioned that, you know, the demand is there. You just need to decide how you want to fill the gap. Uh, so I think at IHS, um, <clears throat> having been around for 10 years, we've uh, taken it upon ourselves to focus mainly on um, investing um, our investors' capital in rental housing because we think uh, with the pace of urbanization there is really a need for rental houses around the urban centers because people come from far away to come work. They don't necessarily want to buy a house where they are, but they want decent accommodation closer to working areas. Um, I'll also touch a bit on where we think um, there is a big opportunity. Um, you'll see uh, the uh, fourth point on that uh, slide is that uh, in South Africa, um, the, the REIT market, um, one of the colleagues uh, explained earlier on what uh, REIT is. Uh, I won't go into that. The REIT market used to be dominated by commercial, industrial, and, and, and retail uh, um, uh, companies. Um, in South Africa, since 2014, um, there has been appetite from the institutional investors to start investing in this asset class being residential rental. Um, that's what I'm going to cover. Um, I forgot to mention earlier on, um, you know, there are some familiar faces around the, the room. Uh, some of them are investors in our funds. Uh, Mr. Moraba from NHFC. Uh, so, He's going to keep me in check so I don't um, exaggerate on some of the points because he's familiar with our fund. Uh, and also the representatives from the IFC, you can see those are one of our investors. That's just a, to show you the flavor of the investors we have in our funds. Uh, we currently manage about four funds. Uh, we've raised um, in the last 10 years um, about 550 million US dollars. 
uh, managing four funds, including uh, a REIT. We've produced um, um, over, uh, you mentioned 35,000 units, but it's, it's actually slightly more than that. Um, I think the, the most important thing to note is that uh, we currently manage about 9,000 rental units um, in, in, in our combined funds. Um, uh, you see the, the, the buildings that are, I've used to break the, the, the topics are actually um, buildings that we have invested in um, in partnership with our development partners. So it is affordable housing um, in our own definition, and, um, but it's, it looks decent. It's in uh, uh, established nodes. Um, we are able to attract people that uh, want to be closer to work opportunities. Um, just to share a bit of our trade secret, um, uh, hoping that you know, some of you might uh, follow on the same path. Um, <clears throat> it really is uh, not an easy um, uh, sell to get investors to, to believe in an asset manager who just lives on asset management fees. Um, you know, we are a pri private equity setup. Um, we don't, for, for, for the little money that we put in alongside our investors, we don't really make huge uh, uh, gains from the investments, but we, we, we live on the asset management fees. But we've taken it upon ourselves to make sure that we are not uh, your traditional uh, private equity manager that just sits and watch what happens with the money. So our team, of about 37 investment specialists uh, really have a real estate background so that when we get into projects with developers, we are able to monitor and we are able to speak the same language and there won't be things that will go uh, unnoticed. Track record is very important. Um, obviously, we target uh, uh, areas where there's infrastructure uh, because our funds run for 10 years uh, we don't have the ability to land bank and, and wait for getting the land right for permits and all of that. So we, we make sure that we get into projects that are, are ready for the top structure. Um, you need to uh, be able to uh, provide uh, fund parameters, uh, um, uh, deal parameters, the sizes, what kind of returns you are promising the investors. And, and most importantly is when you start the conversations is that you must have done your research on the ground, um, especially in the market that you want to go into. The investors are looking for uh, impact, the investors that we work with, but they're also looking for a return. Um, I'll use Kenya as an example. Some of you might be uh, uh, in the know that we, are, we have an ambition to start a, 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 a Kenya a housing fund, um, a green housing fund, I must emphasize. Um, we are a long way in terms of our capital raise there. Um, we've spent about two years um, in investigating the East Africa market, and we decided to land in Kenya, and we also decided that we're going to get in there and do rental housing as opposed to focusing on building to sell to the open market. We all know that the mortgage uh, market in Kenya is... Is, is very small. Um, so if you're building to sell uh, in a private equity format, it might be challenging. How do we exit? Um, we have an ambition to say after seven years or so of holding these assets, we'll exit them onto the, onto the main board, uh, the REIT. Um, again, here we have the experience of doing that in South Africa, where we've exited some of, our ass of the assets that we're in the first fund into a REIT platform, and we are go growing that REIT. Some of the investors can choose to stay in there and liquidate their position as and when the, their shares uh, um, uh, improve. So that's our story. Uh, watch the space. Um, and when we meet in two years' time, I don't know when, I think we'll, we'll be able to, to share our successes there. Um, do I still have time? Okay, just two minutes, all right. Um, 
the key components of success in our view, um, on the ground presence is very key. We started in South Africa. Uh, we mastered the art in South Africa. It was a little bit easy because we're South African. Um, we moved on to, in our second fund, we have what we call the SSA sleeve. Uh, some, of, some of you will call uh, the areas that we are in, uh, or the geographical areas that we are in, uh, Africa light. We were in Botswana and, and Namibia. In Namibia, we have about seven, 75 uh, million US dollars that we are investing on behalf of, the, um, uh, of, of our investors. And we've decided that in order to be successful, you need to partner with local developers. You need to have a local office that can be staffed by um, the local uh, citizens of that country. And then we transfer skills. Um, most of the work gets done in, in Johannesburg, but as and when that team gets experience, we believe that um, uh, um, they'll be good to hold their own. So the same thing we're going to apply in Kenya when we go to Kenya. In Botswana, we have a very small check. So if some of the investors that are in the room here are interested in working with us in Botswana, uh, we think there's a huge demand. We know the population is not that big, but hey, the, the, the gap is, is, is too wide. Um, we prioritize 10 key deals. That is, we don't take delivery risk. Um, because you can imagine private equity money going into land and uh, developing, you know, it's burning uh, for a year or two while you're developing, so we try and avoid uh, development risk. We, most importantly, is two and a half years ago, we decided to have our own property management company because uh, managing uh, residential units is very different from managing commercial and retail. We're dealing with people, you need to have control, you must be on the ground, you must be able to make decisions on those rentals that you are charging on a daily basis because when things are tough, your tenants will leave and go back home and stay at home. So if it means that you need to reduce your rent by 100 bucks, uh, 200 bucks for the time being while things settle, you do that. I think... Um, um, we spoke about it. Uh, I'm going to jump the slide. I can see my time is done. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sorry. Really, really uh, impressive, I think, what you've been uh, doing now. And, and uh, uh, you had also a strong growth, uh, you, 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 you told me. So in rental, uh, expanding to other countries, yeah. uh, also managing the stock yourself uh, the, as a property manager. So that's really uh, impressive. Thank you very much for, sure. for your presentation. Thanks. I now want to give the word to you, uh, Ahmed, and uh, give, you, uh, give us your perspective from the uh, side of the African Development Bank. and. Uh, um, tell us maybe what you see as your role to attract also institutional investors to these kind of, of projects. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sebastian, and thanks for uh, AUHF, CAF, and all other organizers uh, for giving us the opportunity to be here today. I think it's very tricky, uh, honestly, to be speaking in front of my existing clients, my potential clients, and uh, I hope that I manage my, their expectations. Uh, so please, uh, let's keep that discussion ongoing. So when it comes to our engagement, uh, let me start by saying that the African Development Bank has always been engaged in developing the um, uh, infrastructure in Africa, social infrastructure, creating and enabling environments and supporting the financial sector across uh, the, the line. Um, however, back in 2014, the bank um, um, implemented uh, a restructuring in which we had established the capital markets department. And this uh, division, I'm sorry, and the Capital Markets Division um, uh, was one of the divisions that is spearheading the bank support to the demand side of the housing finance in Africa. Uh, the bank has always been uh, perceiving the uh, housing as a high-risk uh, uh, business, and that's why the emphasis was through DFIs such as Shelter Afrique or other uh, uh, local financial institutions. However, in 2014, the intention was to crowd in institutional investors, bring in uh, pension funds resources and also to uh, ensure that the uh, capital is better now and also to ensure that the capital markets is playing a more active role in promoting long term uh, local currency funding and uh, crowding in the savings into the housing uh, finance. 
Um, we have been dealing with different clients, uh, different countries, uh, from uh, building societies to corporates to banks, non-banks. So we have been engaged in different, uh, on different fronts. Um, we have been successful in promoting new asset classes, promoting securitization, and building the story with different uh, type of, of clients. Um, I think, um, um, just to start with the, with the conclusion, that our experience was very positive. Uh, we are not receiving any, so far, touch wood, no shocks from the market. Our money is being disbursed and coming back. The risk, uh, the high risk profile is not uh, as we um, uh, expected. I think we are changing the, um, um, the stereotype and the perception of housing finance in Africa of being a risky business uh, or mass destruction to really um, a wealth creation uh, uh, line of business. Um, 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 when it comes to the way we are structuring our investments or our products or our interventions, we have four main uh, type of products. The first one, which is a classic one, uh, which is a funded facility, a foreign currency or local currency funding, uh, to promote access to long-term uh, funding and also to deepen uh, the mortgage finance and promote lower, middle and middle income households access to uh, adequate mortgages. It's, 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 it's coming to a fruition, we are seeing the results on the ground and we are seeing more and more demand coming to us and we are really seeing also the, when it, it is associated with a sort of a technical assistance that is really um, uh, supporting our people in Africa to have access or to be dealing with robust financial institutions or building societies or even banks. Um, uh, as I said, sometimes it is associated with a technical assistance, uh, sometimes it's on standalone basis. The second main component is the non-funded, non and uh, when it comes to the non-funded, which is closely related to what we are trying to do uh, on the capital markets, uh, which is related to credit enhanced uh, bonds or notes being issued by our mortgage finance uh, companies and other sectors. So we are also doing it with leasing companies, we are doing it with large corporates uh, in the real sector, but since we are talking about mortgage, uh, I will keep talking about it. So we are using it for mortgage-backed securities, securitized notes, and also for uh, uh, corporates who are, able, who are trying to issue bonds on the local capital market. And with our triple A rating and leveraging our balance sheet using our partial credit guarantee, guarantee as a credit enhancement, we are really seeing the difference on two fronts. One is the extended tenors. Uh, so instead of raising short-term notes, we are looking about longer terms and also on the, uh, uh, on the cost uh, of the bond uh, or the prime rate to be paid by the institution, by the, by the corporates. It is also very attractive to institutional investors, especially pension funds and the insurance companies, especially that we give 50% first loss cushion. So it is really, it is really uh, helpful, especially when we are talking about institutions, we are saying that we're building the story with them. Some of them are sitting in this room by which we are helping them to build up the portfolio and then to go and securitize the notes in the future. So it's, it's coming to fruition. Um, and, and product number three, we are all recently, I don't know who is passing this information to the market, but we are receiving a lot of requests to, for equity, uh, which, is, which, is, which is doable. We, are, we have equity uh, uh, headroom for regional uh, type of institutions. But for when it comes to national, uh, it's slightly competitive. And that's why we are coming up with a new structure by which we are promoting the idea of extending the grace periods, extending the repayment profiles, and making our facility looks like, not quasi-equity, but like tier two capital under Basel II. This will give uh, three things. First is the access to capital, to um, uh, make the equity profile of the corporates more uh, relevant for institutional investors, and three, that we are also considering the possibility of sitting on the board. And this is great, crucial, especially for those institutions who want us to play a governance uh, a role. Um, another product, which is the policy reforms. Uh, it is, without policy, we're not doing anything. We're not changing anything. Even if we're putting all our balance sheets into the market, it's not going to uh, create what we are looking for, and that's why we are using our budget supports and uh, this kind of uh, uh, um, budget supports at high level to do this kind of policy reforms, especially in enabling the environment, sh changing the uh, um, the way the risk is being perceived in the market. Um, last and not least, uh, that we are also coming up with new products uh, like the urban development team, who are also setting up new urbanization uh, division. Uh, that was always a missing component in our business. 
It is now coming. Uh, it is uh, our, my colleagues are uh, on the ground. Um, if you want to get engaged with them, and this is really something very important, especially when it comes to land servicing, with policy reforms. Again, as I said, um, training, uh, vocational training, and so on and so forth. Uh, so together, we are structuring stories. We are putting long stories together. We are not working only on the demand side like before. We are also trying to engage on the supply side and create more and more enabling environment. Again, we, we all know that policy is important. Uh, without policies, we will have a big issue in having sustainable uh, business. Um, in a nutshell, what we are looking for is that we are making is, uh, responsible investments. So we are very um, keen when it comes to environmental and social management. We are very keen when it comes to youth empowerment, gender empowerment. Um, um, we are getting investment from our, uh, I mean, from the African Development Bank or any other GFIs. It goes without saying that you are doing a responsible investment, and this paved the way for you also uh, to access other uh, non-African or non-African based institutions like uh, uh, Europeans or Asian or uh, elsewhere. So, okay, so what we are noticing now, um, we are noticing many things. And most importantly, that there is a big, big, big need for innovation the major or acute need to have more reliance on the capital markets, uh, mobilizing pension funds resources, domestic resources, into real sectors, especially housing finance. We are seeing an increasing uh, support to the sector, but we are also seeing increasing uh, um, demand in the, or in increasing backlogs. We don't, we don't like to use the term, but I think we are also facing sort of a housing crisis in different countries, and um, we are not say, using the term, but I think it's term it's a term that must be used. Um, we are also seeing a need for a robust and sustainable macroeconomic environment to help our corporates also to issue bonds. Um, I heard my colleague from the IFC talking about West Africa region, which is very true. They have sort of stable macroeconomic environment um, um, that uh, help in, in promoting capital market solutions. Um, Last but not least is technology. It is time to use technology, microfinance through technology, mobile banking, and so on and so forth. So I think I will, uh, I know you are looking at me, so I'll stop here. <laughs> and I'm open for questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Thank you very much. So let's jump immediately fr from this to, to Yasmina, please, because you were talking about uh, innovation, you were talking about data, you were talking about the different development in, in, in countries. Yasmina, uh, please enlighten us. How does uh, EPIS lo look at, at, at this? And uh, what are the things you are looking at uh, when looking at different uh, opportunities in the, in the housing sector in countries? Sure. Thank you, <coughs> thank you, Sebastian. Yeah, thank you. That was a very nice uh, segue into, into what we think we, we understand what is APIS. But I'd be, I'd be surprised if more than two people knew about APIS partners here today. So I'll give a very quick up, uh, background. We're like uh, Soli, we, we manage a private equity fund, but we just focus on financial services. Uh, that's all we do, and we invest in Africa and Asia. And within financial services, actually, AFDB is uh, we're lucky to have as one of our investors as well. Uh, and within financial services, we pretty much look at everything, including insurance, payments, uh, banking, credit, and so on. But over the last few years, we've identified uh, payments, uh, sorry, payments, but also housing finance as one of our key investment themes. So we're actively looking for opportunities. And uh, just to give you our very quick perspective, and of course, it's not everybody's perspective, but it's how we see it from our offices in, I guess, London, Lagos, uh, San Francisco, and Singapore. So we get, uh, unfortunately, I mean, I'm, Obviously, I'm here, I'm personally convinced that this is a huge opportunity. And yet, if I look at what gets through our desk, what gets into our mailboxes, it's all, always, always around payments, uh, credit, really mainly remittances, a lot of kind of data-driven credit recently, uh, more and more. And I've seen maybe two or three proposals around housing finance. So that, I don't think that means there aren't any, but I, but I think it means you kind of have to create them yourself. You, you can't get a package deal like, like you would for a for other companies that are typically raising. So based on that, we're, we're, we're not claiming that we're gonna be able to find a solution or to innovate, but we're trying to find ways to innovate with the companies that we already know. So for example, uh, I, I guess a quick example is the remittance space. So one of our, actually our largest investment is a remittance platform. And what we've realized is that a lot of these payments actually end up going into either rent or home improvement. 
So we're trying to see if there isn't a way we can structure a product whereby uh, these huge amounts of money that get sent to, to Africa and Asia all the time cannot be channeled through a housing finance product, for example, and just to, I'm sure everybody knows here, but just to give an idea of the context, in Nigeria alone, there was uh, 30 billion in remittances last year. So that's more than aid, more than any DFIs, more than all these sources of income put together. So we think it's a huge space and it's a huge amount of capital that's currently kind of unlocked, uh, or at least is being used to fund housing, but informally. So I think the big gap here is to kind of formalize what's happening informally. Uh, another, I, I guess, uh, topic that we hear about a lot, at least from our perspective, is kind of data-driven credit analytics. And, and as, as you all know, uh, the mortgage industry is huge globally. Again, just to give an idea of the context, it's $15 trillion in the US. It's one of the biggest industries uh, globally. And yet in Africa, even in South Africa, the mortgage industry is, about, is worth about 30% of GDP. In Morocco, 24. And if I look at Ghana and Nigeria, it's about 0 0.5 up to 1% at best. So obviously that means there's a huge gap, but also a big opportunity. And, and some of the reasons why, uh, I guess, financiers tell us they can't uh, I guess issue more mortgages is one, of course, there's a big issue with access to long-term funding, and I think here the DFIs have played a big role and, and continue to do so. But most of that funding is still in foreign currency, so it's, it's a structural you know, issue that's not going to be solved tomorrow. And, and the other issue is they don't know uh, who their potential clients are, they don't know their credit profile. Yet, I mean, so we get proposals all the time trying to uh, I guess build a credit history based on other sources, but we're not yet seeing that in the mortgage market, I suppose, one, because they're much bigger loans, but also I think because these players aren't talking to each other yet. There's a lot of innovation going on in one side, and there's obviously the, the banks that are trying to digitalize, that are trying to go a bit more uh, towards mobile and online. But I think the, the link needs to be made somewhere there. If it's not, maybe more forcefully, I guess I would say. And again, for example, if, if I look at Africa, the average age is 19 years old. Uh, so these are really the people we should be thinking about. And I think these people are, as you know, mobile. They like, uh, they, they're digital. And I think we're not quite capturing them yet. I, I don't claim to have the solution, but uh, I think that's something that, that we need to look into. And, and in the US, for example, 100% of all uh, mortgages are originated online. And I don't think it's a huge stress to think, you know, one day we could see something like that in Africa. But so if I step back and think, so what, what are we seeing? Uh, so for us to, to make an investment, like I think like NEP, we need to make a, a return, a pretty high return for, for our investors. And of course we invest our, our own money. And right now it's a little bit difficult, I think, uh, to really invest in housing finance. And I would, I would say for us, housing finance today is mainly banks. Uh, there's a few specialized, uh, mortgage banks around Africa, we're, we're looking at them very closely, we're interested in the space, but they also face the issue of uh, huge currency depreciation, at least in some markets. So that makes those investments very tough for us to, to look at. But that's not to say we wouldn't like to, to participate in, in what we think is, a, is a really a huge opportunity that's kind of overlooked. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Yasmina. So that's a really interesting perspective. Yes, Thank you very much. Uh, we have very perspectives from three different uh, uh, backgrounds, uh, let, let's say. That's very, very, very interesting. I'll just open the floor for one or two questions because we are almost reaching the, the, the time now. But uh, please use the opportunity uh, here. Yes, please use the microphone in, on the table. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think just two quick questions for the private equity companies that are making lots of profit uh, in Africa. Um, what is your budget for corporate social investment? Uh, you know, is it a percentage of your profit? And what are the key things you've done with all that profit you're making out of Africa? Um, and then lastly, um, uh, Yasmina, you talked about 30 billion US dollars going through remittances into Nigeria. And you mentioned that uh, some of it should go into innovation for housing finance in terms of product. Um, is there a product you're working on? Um, we, we're very interested in, in innovation. Thank you. Thank you. Jasmina, can I give you the floor? Yeah, sure. Uh, 
No, thank you for the question. So maybe I'll start with the, uh, let, let me start with the first one. Uh, well, we're a, we're a very young team. You know, we, we started in 2014, so we're not making huge profits yet. But obviously, I, th I think uh, I think we, we should not. I, I didn't say at the beginning, but really, our underlying investment team, what, what drives everything we do, is financial inclusion, and and that's why we just invest in financial services. So we think by default, everything that we do has has an impact. We don't really differentiate between this investment makes too much money, not, not enough impact. It, it's really a, a balance of both. And, and we think it's critical to generate attractive investments because I, I think what's going to be transformational for, for African P, and I'm an African Moroccan, I should say also, is, is going to be when we're able to attract more than just DFI capital. And I think that's really going to be the game changer because right now, uh, Last year in Africa, less than $2 billion was raised for, for private equity altogether. All That's between all of us, and I think there's a few hundred of us. In the UK, one fund closed more than that, a, a mid-cap fund. So I think we still have a long, long, long way to go. And I think to get that kind of money, we're going to have to prove that we can generate profits and, and returns. So that's very important. And, and for us, that's the impact, really. It's not, we, we don't really see it separately from profitability, really. And of course, any company that we back is, is in Africa, pays taxes in Africa, and employs Africans, and, and so on. So we don't really have a separate budget. We, we think everything we do is, uh, is impactful, or we hope at, at least, and that's what we strive to do. And in terms of the second, even more difficult question, are we working on a product? I, we, yeah, we're, we're looking at a few things. I, I can't really say, I think right now, it's, uh, it's a little bit too soon, but there's others who are, I think, far ahead of us. There, there's a few banks I know in Kenya, in Tanzania, and now in Nigeria that, are, that already have a product called the Diaspora Mortgage, uh, which is quite interesting and, and tries to do that. And I think even in Zambia, uh, but, but of course, like, like everything, it's, we, we think it's a partial solution because a lot of these products have some issues like uh, tying you in with a very low kind of teaser rate. And then as the currency changes, the, the rates can go up to 30, 35%. So it's actually not that viable. But, but it's, it's a step in the, in the right direction. And, and we're sure there's many others. OK. Thank, thank, thank you very much. One, one last question. <coughs> yes, please. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question for um, the gentleman from the International Housing Solution. You made mention of the building to rent model. Um, I'm from Sierra Leone. I work for the Sierra Leone Housing Corporation. We realized that over the years, we developed a model like that, wherein we build houses and we let them out. But some people lose their jobs over the years, and it's difficult for them to pay back. So, I mean, you know, the rent accumulate, and it gets tougher for them to pay. So I don't know really, I want advice, how you handle that, especially you're talking about a very successful Project. Yes, thank you very much for that uh, important question. Is how, so how do you deal with this? Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, so I didn't answer the question Andrew asked about. Uh, very shortly, you can take the two indeed yeah, because so, it's an important um, one we, as well. There's yeah. no specific budget. We, we're also not making huge profits. Uh, but um, <clears throat> we look at. Uh, but you have impact yeah. investors behind yeah, you, yes, eh? so there is a pressure from them. That's, yeah. Yeah. So in terms of, um, you, you know, we, we're not. Uh, our um, tenants are obviously screened when they come in. And yes, people do lose jobs. Um, we enter into uh, monthly leases with our tenants to allow them to be able to uh, move out when situation uh, doesn't allow for them to, to carry on paying rent. We unfortunately do not allow them to accumulate um, areas uh, because that just won't work. So where they cannot pay for a month or two, we then agree to part ways. That's the only way we can do it. You know, it's not, uh, it's, it's not, uh, um, it's open market uh, rentals and, you know, if you can't pay, you unfortunately have to leave. Thank you very much. So can we give them a big round of applause, please, for this uh, amazing panel? Thank you. Thank you very much. So we directly move on to the next panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Which will be moderated by Pamela, indeed. Just une information par rapport à l'agenda que vous avez. La, le panel 
So, so you're dealing with the case of Zambia home loans. That's right. Okay. Donc le, 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 la session qui se tient maintenant était la session prévue à 14h50 jusqu'à jusqu 15h30. Donc la, cette session a lieu tout de suite et la session qui devait avoir lieu à, à midi 15 passe donc à 14h50. La session sur le leveraging pension funds along the housing value, value chain. Merci.